Hey podcast, it's Drew. On today's episode, we have master EMDR therapist, Dr. Steven Danziger. He's here to talk to us about EMDR therapy, which stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. EMDR therapy has been proven to help people recover from trauma and other distressing life experiences, including PTSD, anxiety, depression, and panic disorders by resolving unprocessed traumatic memories in the brain. This is not just theory, this is proven. Our brains have a natural way to recover from traumatic memories and events. This process involves communication between the amygdala, the lizard brain, our old ancient brain, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. Sometimes we process trauma spontaneously, just living our everyday life, but other times we actually need help. And EMDR is something that you can do with a therapist who can help you. Stress responses are a part of our natural fight or flight or freeze instincts. When distress from disturbing events remains, the upsetting images, thoughts, and emotions may create a feeling of overwhelm, of being back in that moment, back in that traumatic situation or event, and being back frozen in the time that the event that happened. That's what a lot of people experience when they experience trauma. EMDR therapy helps the brain process these memories, process these images, and allows normal healing to resume. It's actually quite astounding. The experiences are still remembered, but the fight, flight, or freeze response from the original event are resolved. It takes time and it works in conjunction with talk therapy and that's what Dr. Danziger is going to go into. Dr. Danziger walks us through what EMDR is, how a therapy session looks and how it works and he also shares stories of patients who have experienced EMDR therapy and what it's meant for them in their life. It's a great podcast and Dr. Danziger is really detail oriented so he's going to give you a full walkthrough and the reason that we're really presenting this podcast to you is that so many times when our brain is broken, even though I'm here to remind you that your brain isn't broken, when we feel our brain is broken, when we're stuck in trauma, when we are stuck in limiting beliefs, when we're stuck in bad health or chronic disease, we're not always aware of the tools and resources that are out there that can actually help us get better. And this podcast is dedicated to showing and highlighting those tools, therapies, interventions, mindset topics that can actually help you get better. EMDR looks to be one of them. Here we go into my interview with Dr. Steven Danziger. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, mindset, and more. I'm your host, Drew Pruitt, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Steven Danziger. Dr. Danziger is a master EMDR therapist. If you don't know what that is, stay tuned. We're going to explain it. And he has provided EMDR therapy training to hundreds of clinicians. He developed the Meta Protocol a system for combining mindfulness and EMDR therapy, which aims to combine the best of Buddhist mindfulness training and EMDR. Dr. Danziger has practiced Buddhist mindfulness for over 30 years, including a one-year residency at a Zen monastery. Fun fact, at the age of 16, he started playing drums in rock bands, and you can still catch him every now and then playing the drums. Dr. Danziger is the author of five books covering clinician self-care, Buddhist psychology, anger management, EMDR therapy, and the 12-step process. Dr. Steven Danziger, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you, Drew. I'm so happy to be here. Looking you know, forward to it. EMDR therapy has come up a bunch of times in conversations uh, in our podcast, but we've never really had an expert a clinician, a practitioner who actually delivers this therapy and uh, is really considered uh, you know, a leader in their field. And so when I was looking around, I came across your profile, your webpage, saw the books that you got a chance to write in your past and the education that you do for other clinicians. And um, I'm really excited that you're here to really break down this powerful tool and technology and share a little bit about how you're evolving it and adding to it with your mindfulness 
therapies and uh, treatments that you include into your practice. So let's start at the beginning. There's a lot of people on this podcast that have never even heard the term EMDR. What is it and what does EMDR stand for? So the short version of the story is that uh, EMDR actually stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And it's not actually really the best name for the therapy. Uh, but that's, that's what happens sometimes, right? Uh, Coca-Cola no longer has cocaine in it, but it's still called Coca-Cola. And that's kind of what happened with EMDR. In as much as uh, a psychologist named Francine Shapiro, who actually only passed away about a year and a half ago, um, she was uh, a cancer survivor. She was a cancer patient, actually. And she was seeking mind, body, spirit, medicine uh, ways of dealing with her cancer. And so in that journey, she came across a number of different uh, mind, body, spirit uh, modalities. And uh, one of those was mindfulness. And I'm kind of leading with this because it's an important part of the story from, from where I'm sitting. Uh, and what she learned mindfulness from Stephen Levine, who is a Buddhist teacher. He passed away a few years ago. And in her mindfulness practice, she was walking through the park. And she noticed that she had one of her, you know, kind of negative thoughts about her cancer. And she also noticed that her eyes were kind of tracking trees back and forth. And she had not noticed this before, kind of like, you know, Newton, everyone saw apples fall off trees and then Newton went, well, what's, what's that? And so she kind of sat with it. She just noticed the eye movements and noticed the thought. And then the eye movements kind of basically died down. And she noticed she wasn't thinking the bad thoughts so much anymore. So she tried, and that was it. So she then she tried it again, right? She, she uh, brought up another lousy thought and moved her eyes back and forth rapidly. And wow, it feels a little better. Went home. She was living in like a house, guest house situation here in Southern California. And it was another psychologist. And she said, you mind if I ask you to, you know, think of a crappy thing and then uh, I'll wave my finger in front of your face? And he said, sure. And if you know the guy who it was, he, he was the perfect person at the right time. Um, and he did it, and he's like, yeah, it feels a little better. And so that was the birth of it in as much as she noticed the effect of this bilateral stimulation. And then she went on, she was a psychologist, so she went on to basically put a protocol together that for, for me represents the best of Eastern, Western, and indigenous psychology uh, around the bilateral stimulation and utilizing the action of the bilateral stimulation to help people to take maladaptively stored memories, as in stored in places not really good for long-term storage, and move them to an adaptive resolution. In other words, to that part of the brain that can say, yes, that happened, but it's not happening now. And that's the very, you know, that's the very condensed version of something that has now been going on for over 30 years. It's evidence-based according to the World Health Organization for PTSD. And it, the research base has built for all sorts of other difficulties and dilemmas. And so very exciting time for EMDR right now. Very exciting time. And I want to break down a few things that you talked about there. Um, I've heard you in other talks on YouTube and podcasts before talk about memories and especially traumatic memories and where they are stored in the brain and the primitive brain. Just break that down because that might be a little bit new for some of our audience that's out there. Why is it that sometimes certain memories are stored in different parts of the brain? Sure. So, you know, we have, some people would call it three parts of the brain. Others would call it three brains, right? Uh, uh, three different evolutionarily uh, developed brains. The uh, reptilian brain that we share with reptiles that does all the basics of like breathing and reproduction and digestion. Um, and it's very reactive to direct stimulation, right? Like I, I have lizards outside my front door. The sun hits them too hard. They run under the rock. And then there's the uh, brain that was developed uh, in the mammals, uh, the limbic brain, which has those, um, it's an upgrade to the straight fight or flight system where uh, we have an, an emotional brain that is involved in those kind of attachment behaviors that help in, first of all, keeping us safe, like knowing what's not safe, but also being able to attach to uh, others in a way that brings more safety, let's say in community and uh, you know, reproduction, all the other things that keep things going. 
And so we have both of those brains, uh, you know, or parts of the brain. And then we have something unique to the primates, the neocortex, the, the cortical regions. And there is where all the human, the, the um, making meaning, the uh, being able to, uh, you know, judgment and, and all the things that we can do as human beings. And that's the place of long-term storage, right? Like when things come into the system, they're usually coming in through the reptilian and the limbic brain first. Is this a threat? And so if it is a threat, uh, the limbic brain and the reptilian brain work together to assess it and to take action. And I'm glad that this happens, right? I'm glad that I have this uh, aspect of myself. But what happens is sometimes uh, the activation is way too strong and to the point where the processing never happens um, for the information to get to the longer term storage. And so the limbic brain is built for medium term storage and the body also can absorb a lot of these memories and soma you know, somatic experiences of the memory. And so uh, the, the way it's stored in the limbic brain, there's no time stamp on it. There's no meaning made of it. It's just the, the negative perceptions, the affects, you know, the sounds, the sights, and what's happening is it's kind of in an, an eternal now kind of availability. And so something happens today that reminds me of that, uh, those affects, those sensations, and it triggers that response, that same response, that fight or flight response that happened before. And because there's no processing of it, I don't know the difference between then and now. And so that, the past reinforces the present, which reinforces the past, right? In other words, this terrible snowball effect happens. And so people who are suffering from PTSD or other difficulties like depression, anxiety, uh, addiction, are, that's the, the brain and the body trying to adapt in, in certain ways, right? Like trying to stop this terrible process from happening, but it's not a solution. It's, it's a temporary solution. For instance, like with addiction. You know, it's like I take a substance and it's like calm down for a bit, but then it's, you know, it's back. There's no solution. So what we're hoping for with EMDR or any trauma modality is that the processing finishes to the point, again, where I know that it's not happening now. And I, I could give a quick example, like a combat vet, for instance. Here's yeah, a, yeah, here's a, um, a, a car backfire in the street, right? And so a person with PTSD, they're not going to be, well, it's 2020, I'm walking down a street in Los Angeles, probably a car backfiring, but you can never be too careful, I'm going to dive under this desk or whatever I have a veil you know, to dive under. They are back wherever they were in combat, right? It's happening now. So when a person has, it, uh, uh, has the, um, uh, the therapy that helps them to get to the here and now, they're still going to have the... The, the response, right? Like the car backfires and they're going to be, they're going to be shocked, but then they're going to be able to say it's 2020. I'm in a street in Los Angeles. That was loud. That was scary. Right? So we don't lose our, our ability to take care of ourselves, but we are able to manage, you know, the present as opposed to being driven around by um, the past. So, so let's connect the visualizations and kind of, give an example of what happens when you're working or EMDR therapist, uh, somebody you've trained is working actually with someone. So Francine noticed, as you had mentioned, she was walking in the park and as her eyes would track back and forth in this bilateral movement, there would be a different processing of these painful past emotions that were there. So as a therapist, when you're working with somebody, if somebody was watching the two of you, what would they see? So uh, some people would be surprised because those who have just like the smallest amount of a knowledge of EMDR uh, believe that someone comes into my office and I'm like, think of the worst thing that ever happened to you. Okay, follow my fingers, right? <laughs> and that's not how it goes, right? That would be uh, kind of old school. It would be uh, jumping a person into doing something that they're not ready to do. So uh, Dr. Shapiro's protocol was an eight is an eight-phase protocol. And the first two phases are dedicated to history taking and resourcing. So a person who is, you know, fly on the wall in the EMDR session, first few sessions, first number of sessions, would be seeing what looked kind of familiar, you know, uh, get rapport being built, uh, getting to know the client, getting to know what it is that's, that's bothering them. The thing that's different with EMDR therapy, or one of the things, 
is that um, we take history in a different way. Like we'll take the history and then at a certain point, we'll say, um, you know, by the way, you don't have to tell me your whole story for me to help you. I just need newspaper headlines. And so what we'll do is we'll do some work around figuring out what the main themes are, what the main problems are, the presenting issues. And then we'll look at the negative beliefs that go with that, like I am unworthy or I am alone or any of these kind of negative beliefs about self. And then we'll float back in the memory banks to find times that connect to that I am unworthy. Like what's the earliest time that that was true for you? And what comes out of that is really remarkable. Like you, you know, you also would think that we are only working with like the worst of the worst trauma, when in fact, we're working with trauma and adverse life events, which is basically what everyone shares in this life. And so, for instance, you, you, you have a person come in and you do that float back and there's maybe they even have some big T traumas that represent I am unworthy, but they go back to like, I, I was eight years old and I was pitching in Little League and I lost the game and my dad was always supportive of me, but on that day, he looked at me kind of sideways, and I am unworthy has been with me ever since then, right? So we get to find that it's, it's not just about the nature of the event. As a matter of fact, that was one of Shapiro's biggest contributions, was really moving us from the PTSD DSM diagnosis that focuses so much on the nature of the event has to be, like life or death, and then really looking at each individual's response you know, to, to, the, to difficulties, whether they be a big T acknowledged trauma or just, just adverse life events. And so, um, so that's what the first uh, phase looks like. The second phase is called resourcing or preparation. And so there, we are working to increase the person's affective window of tolerance. In other words, so that they can take on more affect, more emotion in their lives in general, and also then when we're doing the trauma work, they're able to go further into it, as it were. Also increasing distress tolerance, like that I can live through more and more and, and uh, more of a variety of, of difficulties. And so that helps the person already to get symptom relief, you know, early in the therapy, before we ever get to this part, right? And early on, Shapiro's resourcing techniques were very focused on visualization techniques, like the happy place, uh, light stream, like a light stream visualization over or through your body. And now our philosophy is resources are anything and everything that is healthy and or adaptive to the client in front of you. So those first two phases, you'd be seeing us working together on mindfulness-based skills and, and validating and building upon any and all other resources, internal and external, that the client has. Then, that's when it will get weird looking, is you know, they would see we we're ready to um, do some reprocessing, and uh, the client and I, at this point, are really collaborators, and we're looking at the treatment plan together. And it's like, okay, what, what are we going to tackle? What are we going to reprocess here? And so then we do the reprocessing phases, which is three through six. And I call that Shapira's special sauce. And that's where it looks and feels different than other therapies. And so what would happen is I would say I would activate the memory, all the different aspects of it, the cognitive, the limbic, the emotional, and the body. So I'm purposely exposing or purposely activating the memory. But then I say, okay, notice all that and follow my fingers. or pay attention to the buzzies bzz, 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 or can, audio can you, sense. can you explain the buzzies uh, if people are not familiar with that? Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, so, uh, early in Shapiro's practice, she first published, uh, EMDR actually only as EMD because she hadn't seen the reprocessing part yet. She just saw that it desensitized kind of like Valium without the side effects and then later changed it to EMDR and early in her work, uh, someone who was sight impaired came into her office and she was like, oh no, what am I going to do? They couldn't track the eye movements. So she thought maybe tactile stimulation, right? Or audio tone stimulation of a similar variety back and forth rapidly would work. And the way I understand it, that very first time she tapped on their knees and the results were the same. And so again, going back to why the eye movement thing is it's not so great. It kind of uh, was a drag on the therapy for many years because people were 
so hyper focused on the eye movements. It also made it seem more techniquey that way, um, you know, as opposed to a therapy. It was like a, a technique. Um, but very early on, I would say a majority of therapists are using um, vibration or tactile or tapping, or they're using um, audio tones uh, in their office. So, you know, we have, you know, a lot of us have buzzies in our office, you know, just little, I, I have the controls and the client is holding them and and I told you offline beforehand that, you know, I've developed some technology where the buzzies are in the feet. Um, and there's, uh, you know, just audio tones. It's not hard to hook up, right? You can even use an old pair of Walkman headphones and get the tones going back and forth. And so the person is paying attention to the bilateral stimulation, however it's being delivered while they're not like holding the memory. We don't ask them to like hold on to that memory. We've given them some training in mindfulness beforehand. So we're just asking them to notice whatever they're noticing as the bilateral is going on. And it's, so it's done in silence. Then at the end of a set of eye movements or whatever I'm using, I'll say, all right, take a breath. And then I'll ask, this is Shapiro's mindfulness question. What are you noticing now? Right? So someone without mindfulness training may not really have an idea of what that really means. I'm not asking, what are you feeling? I'm not asking, what are you thinking? I'm not asking, what body? I'm asking, what are you noticing? Which can be anything. And so they report that. And then when they're done with their report, 95% of the time, the next thing I say is, okay, notice that. And we keep going. So we just keep going. And what you start to notice is, um, I'll give you an example of like a complete session where someone goes down to zero is that eventually the responses become more adaptive and eventually they get down to a zero and the zero looks, you'll hear a lot of different reports of a zero because the zero can mean like, I feel this is great. This is unicorns, barfing glitter and, and poop and rainbows, or it could be just neutral, right? Like it's okay. It's not happening now. A lot of people describe like, uh, at the towards the end of a session, they'll say it's like a black and white picture, and it's about five feet away from me, and I know it's me, and I know it happened, and I know it sucked, but it's not. It's just not charging me the same way. And, and so a, then, and a zero is uh, is it on a scale that somebody's processing? Yes, thank you. So so at the beginning of the session or the, the beginning of the activation. I'm activating the image, you know, what image represents the worst part of it. Then what negative belief do you have about yourself in this moment as you consider the image? What positive image would you rather be able to have about yourself? And often that's obviously some, it, it's nothing that much better than I'm worthy of breathing air, you know, because people are being activated into the negative experience. We ask them how valid, this was Shapiro's own scale, uh, which he designed to be very different from the, um, Subject, subjective units of distress scale that we use for the, the disturbance, which is zero to 10. So we ask for the, how true is this positive belief, one to seven? So this is a way of kind of wrapping up the whole cognitive horror or dissonance or difficulty uh, in one sort of space. Then we ask the emotions. What, what emotions are you feeling right now as you consider the negative belief in the image? And then put it all together, zero to 10. So we use the classic zero to 10 suds scale uh, to, to how distressing it is, is it in this moment? Zero to 10, zero is nothing at all or neutral. 10 is the worst you could ever imagine. So in then, regards to this painful belief, thought, memory, that's there. How much is it causing something? Yes. And by that time, see, we're, we're in that moment, right? And so by that time, we've triggered the memory such that the zero to 10 is often very high. Right. And and elements of the memory may have already shifted a little bit because of, you know, what's the negative belief? Which, what would you rather believe? What are the emotions? And then we get that zero to 10. And then we ask them, all right, what are you noticing in your body? Now, you know, that's the last element. Right. That's the last element of the, you know, the three elements of what it is we're trying to reprocess, to reinte to integrate and to reintegrate and to reprocess. So that um, that which is living in the body, that which is living in the limbic system that doesn't belong there or that needs to process, finish processing to the uh, neocortical can do so. And so that's when we then you know, start 
the unused. So then, yes, so when we get to a zero, um, that means it's been uh, desensitized uh, to the point where it's no longer um, triggering, no longer charged. And so Shapiro was not satisfied with just desensitizing. She wanted to then further reprocess it so that we would install, literally, we use that word, a positive belief to go with the new version of the memory. So we check that original positive belief. Usually it's gotten a lot stronger, like I am totally safe or I am, you know, I am Superman. And then uh, we have them uh, uh, reprocess that until that gets to a seven of truth. So seven being the highest on that scale of um, how true is that positive belief as you think about the image. And then we do a body scan. The sixth phase is we do a body scan and not like a long, like Buddhist style body scan or, you know, progressive relaxation. Just check your body head to toe. And then we work out any, reprocess any residual or we strengthen any good feelings. And then we close the session. And uh, just so you know, like not every session goes to a zero and a seven. Yay. And a lot of times, you know, we get it down to, let's say, a two or a three or a four. And then with 10 minutes to go, we'll say, you've done some really great work. Um, let's, uh, let's close down. What do you need to transition, right? We don't want to leave someone hanging. We don't want to reprocess all the way to the end of the session and have them go back out into the street at a level four activation. We want to take time in the last 10 minutes to do whatever it is they need to dial it down. And for every client, that's different. Some clients want to do a meditation. Some just want to talk to kind of be relational in that way. Um, whatever so, it is that works for them. So, so let's zoom out a little bit to provide a little context to the detail that Absolutely. you just shared. What is the thinking of what's happening when this bilateral movement is happening? What's actually happening in the brain that makes this approach so powerful. So Shapiro, her, the therapy was developed um, backwards from most therapies. Most therapies were theory first and then the mechanisms of action were developed to get to the result desired or theorized. And in this case, she saw the eye movements. She's like, what's going on? And so she dove into learning and memory uh, and behavioral theory uh, to come up with her model, which was the adaptive information processing model, which describes from her perspective what it is we posit is happening during the process, which is, um, which in terms of the mechanisms of action, there's a number of positive, posited mechanisms of action. And so, um, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I know my neuroscience enough to know the theories that are uh, behind what we think is happening. So a couple of them are, or most of them are, uh, first of all, the REM sleep theory, that uh, this is mimicking REM sleep uh, in a waking state. And REM sleep, it used to be thought that that REM move, the rapid eye movement, was the person kind of watching the dreamscape. And now it's seen more as this primitive action that all the animals seem to share where the data dump is going on. Um, that's during REM sleep that um, certain memories are just filed under garbage and then others are sent to the long-term uh, processing and all that. And so the thought is that the bilateral is doing the action of REM sleep to the person as they're in the waking state. Another theory is the working memory theory, that uh, the bilateral is providing a very specific type of sort of jogging of the working memory, giving the working memory something to work on that seems to kind of open up and start the processing system going again. Um, so that's another thought. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a both and kind of a guy. So um, scientists hate me uh, because I think it's all of these things. Uh, there's also the mindfulness theory, you know, that it's, a, it's literally a mindful, the same kind of uh, scan studies and other studies that they've done of people doing mindfulness practice, same kind of action going on during the bilateral and the noticing uh, that is providing this uh, action. Um, and then uh, my favorite um, theory, the one that I was introduced to first, was uh, around the orienting response that we share with uh, other animals, right? Uh, for instance, like let's say I was a deer in the forest and uh, I'm munching on grass, and 
uh, I hear something about 100 times an hour. And I look up every time because I need to stay safe. And so let's say 98 times out of 100, I look up, wind through the trees, boring. I go back to eating my breakfast. One time out of 100, oh my gosh, that is the most beautiful deer I've ever seen, right? The exciting uh, the go towards response. And then let's say one time out of 100, it's, um, it's a bear, right? So I run and I get away and it takes about an hour, right? For the cortisol and the adrenaline and all the, all the fight or flight stuff that helped me to get away, to drain out of the body. And if you've ever seen this either in a person or you've seen it, uh, I used to see it in uh, films, you know, like National Geographic films uh, back in the day when I was a kid, um, there's this violent shaking that happens. And it's like the, the cortisol and the adrenaline and the experience is just like literally going out the extremities, right? And then at the end of that hour for the deer, it's over. And I'm munching on grass again. And I'm not looking up 102 times an hour. I'm still just, you know, 100 times an hour I look up and I'm taking care of myself that way. Now with human beings, there's a couple of ways this can manifest, one of which is the neocortex might actually kind of register what happened and say, whoa, that really sucked. I'm never going to think about that again, which is impossible, right? So it kind of kicks back to the more primitive parts of the brain or the body gets stuck there. Or another response we see is, whoa, that really sucked. I better be looking for that everywhere all the time, right? Like in the deer example, it's like everything's a bear. Hypervigilance. And so the other response that can happen also is the freeze response, right? So um, where uh, either mildly or more than mildly dissociating uh, from the experience, uh, you know, going into freeze and either having a blackout, like no memory, or having a memory but not being able to process at all. So um, what the, the thought is that with EMDR, what's happening in the brain in a very general way, is that the eye movements, right, is the 98 times out of 100 where there's no threat. And then uh, we're activating the worst of the memory and eventually through the bilateral, we're bringing it to this part of the brain to where it's, you know, it's boring. It's, it's okay. It's not happening now. It's not a threat. Um, we can move on. So to, to add to that, to, to give a little bit more context, you know, we, we had... Um we had a neuroscientist on the podcast, uh, Andrew Huberman from uh, Stanford yes. University, uh -huh. who talked about uh, the idea that this is sometimes the reason why that people go outside for a walk, just like Francine, and they feel better with things. Yes. So t talk to us a little about our sort of modern industrialized lifestyle, where we are not moving that much, and we're not sort of... Uh, living as our ancestors would, even in the relative, you know, even a thousand years ago, where we would have to just walk more and be outside more and sort of see nature. How is our modern industrial way of living playing an impact on this thing that would naturally happen if we were just living the way that kind of we evolved? Yes. So that's why over the years, um, those of us who work in you know, the community of providers and, and therapists that work uh, with EMDR in this sort of mindful context uh, that I do, that's why we've become obsessed with the resourcing. That's why we've become obsessed with, um, well, not obsessed, that's the wrong word. Uh, I might take you for that. But um, we're, uh, we're focused on it in such a way that it allows for the client to develop some of that which is missing in our, you know, industrial modern life of, you know, staring at my phone and not moving around and not being, uh, having to uh, go out and about. I actually, I, it's funny that you bring it up from that perspective too, because uh, a lot of times when I'm teaching more on the side of the, the Dharma, you know, the, the Buddhist, the mindfulness, and talking about, you know, 2,600 years ago, what would Buddha have taught today when faced with, um, you know, sort of the modern version of the, the, the human dilemma of suffering. Probably would have taught a lot of the same stuff, but there might have been some, some uh, you know, different uh, touches to it. And I, I, I feel like uh, EMDR and the resourcing phase of EMDR and the idea that we have to do closure at the end of a session speaks to this idea that we need to bring people to their natural bilateral, their natural movement connection with the body, connection with the earth, connection with nature. 
in order so that they have a baseline of the resilience that's available just from that. And then to build, then we build upon that because it becomes, especially in the modern world, I think it's really, really person to person, right? Like one person's yoga solution is another person's yoga hell, right? It's like not everyone responds to the same resources. The, not everyone responds the same way to touching into what you were just talking about, right? So finding what, what EMDR therapy first couple of phases tells me to do and allows me to do is to find out what would do the, what you described for the person in front of me. So then we can utilize that, leverage that to help them heal that which ails them. And then what happens when they um, reprocess some of these memories, not just all of them, but some of them, they tap into new resources. They're able to touch the earth more. They're able to tap into nature more. They're able to uh, define, further define what they might define as their, their best self or higher self or true self. Right. I would love if you could think, I'm putting you on the spot here, of a case study or story about uh, a patient of yours, somebody um, who came in and maybe was dealing with a past trauma or an addiction. And um, if you could share a little bit about, uh, if, you, if one comes to mind and you feel comfortable, if you could share a little bit about what this modality and, and therapy has meant for them in their life? So the first one that comes to mind is someone who I know is very comfortable with the story being shared, you know, even though I'm obviously not going to give a ton of details about them anyway. Um, but the first one that comes to mind is uh, someone who helped in my, I guess it's now five year striving to bust the myth that you have to wait a certain amount of time to do EMDR therapy with somebody. Um, which is based on the myth that the therapy is, hi, what's the worst thing that happened to you? Follow my fingers, right? So um, this is someone who came into, so a person who had a 30-year on and off opioid addiction, and they had a trauma history, and they also had a mindfulness practice that they practiced on and off, I would say for about 20 years is the way I understood it. And so they ended up in a treatment center that I was running that was using uh, Buddhist mindfulness and EMDR as the central therapies or the central programming. And that's why he came to the place because he had a mindfulness background. And he said, you know, my, I had a recurrence of my PTSD that led to me using opioids again. And that's why I ended up back here in treatment. And so what we did was, which I think, you know, that this is what needs to be done. And most practitioners I know do this, which is to, to get an understanding of, you know, this relapse. I was about to do air quotes, but I'll call it a relapse or this lapse. You know, how long was it? You know, how much was it? How much off his game did it throw him? You know, as opposed to thinking, oh, you've used and now you're, you have to learn everything all over again, which is, again, another myth, especially in the addiction treatment field. And so what we did was we looked at that and we also kind of inquired, not kind of, we inquired about his resources, like the mindfulness. And he actually had some really strong mindfulness practice. So we realized that, oh my goodness, you know, this, this guy's ready to do the work, right? And he came seeking these modalities. And so it was a perfect marriage in that way. So this person was in our treatment center for 60 days, six zero, and processed all the PTSD symptoms, all the PTSD memories, basically left without a PTSD diagnosis. Also maintained his abstinence throughout the treatment, um, revitalized his mindfulness practice, revitalized his feeling of, oh, I'm going to utilize mindfulness when I leave here and be in a community of mindfulness practitioners. I'm also gonna go to my you know, 12 step support and I'm going to continue to seek trauma-focused treatment anytime and every time that I uh, have a difficulty like this. I'll, maybe I'll be able to get at it before I use the opioids now. And so this person has reported to me that it's three years later, and they're still abstinent, and they're free of their PTSD. And so um, that's one example of when a person comes into 
a treatment center that is looking at the situation from a trauma-focused viewpoint, a mindfulness viewpoint, and then also a uh, being mindful from the first intake. Like just because they're coming into a treatment center, having just had a relapse with opioids doesn't mean they are X, Y, and Z. They're an individual, and there's, there's lots for us to discover in order for us to plan the treatment. So I'm not saying that everybody becomes, so, oh my goodness, everybody seems to be resourced enough. But what happens is, is if a person does treatment this way, they're guaranteed to get the first two phases of EMDR therapy, and then they are encouraged to continue that when they leave, right? And people tend also to stay in treatment longer that need the treatment in order to complete their trauma therapy, um, which then gives them longer access to the other people in treatment and the staff and, and all of that. So that's a treatment world uh, example. And then I've had other people, uh, obviously, in my private practice who uh, many people who come to me with very horrific childhood trauma histories. And um, I'm able to, uh, have been able to um, give them enough hope and enough psychoeducation about what it is that they're dealing with. You know, a lot of times it's news to people, you know, that um, trauma is implicated, that they even have trauma. I've had people with the worst trauma histories, and this is part of the trauma response, who are like, yeah, I, I don't have trauma. You know, um, I wasn't in combat, or I, I don't live here, there, or wherever people are traumatized. Um, so spending that time with folks um, to, to really learn their, their, their true history, their resources, to share in that experience with them, uh, to help them to uh, feel safe enough to go with me on the journey, go together on the journey of reprocessing those memories. And um, so uh, one, one thing I'll say that kind of in a general way about my private practice and what I, how I say it to tra trainees is that, uh, you know, if someone comes to my office in the past, I might say, ooh, this is going to be five years. We're going to be working for five years. This is very complex trauma. You know, it's going to take us five years. Um, with EMDR, that's about one year. And again, there's no guarantees, but it's just in a, in a general way. Like people used to think it was like the highest speed therapy ever. Like someone with complex trauma, 12 sessions an hour. Not that fast, but faster than um, other therapies in that way. Powerful. Just really highlighting the potential of what's all there. Uh, Dr. Danziger, this is great. We've covered so many uh, different things. Uh, you have a small private practice, right? There are openings every so often, but I'd love to talk, I'd love to talk about for a second, like if people are hearing this and they're like, okay, I have always heard about this, or maybe I thought I heard about it, or I watched, you know, an episode of some TV show that featured it, but I really think that I can identify uh, through my life experiences, whatever they might be, and I want to explore it, um, what's the best way for them to explore and find the right therapist uh, to work with them? So there's a number of different ways you could go. One is to, if you're looking for the broad strokes, people can go to the EMDRIA website, emdria.org, and that gives people the full sort of width and breadth of what's out there, uh, including our training organization. So putting it out there, right, that uh, about six or seven years ago, uh, the EMDR Institute uh, and EMDRIA were the same thing. And they decided that's not really healthy. Let's allow other voices into the training world. So we're one of the training organizations that provides EMDRIA approved training. But another place, anyone is invited to, to come to my website, drdanziger.com or to email me at steve at drdanziger.com. And I am always ready to engage in seeing if I'm the person or one of my referents or referrals are the person. Uh, and or um, if, if you're a clinician and you're looking to get trained, I'll even you know, lead you to the training that seems like it's the right fit for you. So that's my, my passion is to get the folks set up with the person that's right for them. So. Um, there's a, a lot of ways to do that. I, I like it when people come my way because I feel very strongly about our mindfulness-based approach. I feel really strongly about our 
focus and are leaning into the resourcing and the part of the therapy that really helps a person prepare to do this kind of work so that it gets done right. Uh, so, so yeah, there's uh, that. And then also um, my colleague, Jamie, you know, the Institute through which I'm senior faculty, the Institute for creative mindfulness, uh, com. That's perfect. And you mentioned about clinicians. There's also some resources, some books that you have. We'll have the links for all these in the show notes, but is there one that you might want to highlight here while we're uh, on the podcast? So I'll, I'll just highlight uh, the ones that, are, that just came out a few days ago. Yeah, uh, and yeah let's, let's do that. Um, so Jamie, the way I met Jamie Marich was she wrote a book called Trauma and the 12 Steps uh, in 2011. And I found her on the interwebs and I ran after her and I brought her out here to California to train my staff. And we've been friends and collaborators ever since. So uh, she put out the second edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps on North Atlantic Books and they were uh, very supportive of our desire to put out a daily meditation reader. So a daily meditation reader, you know, 366 meditations um, for people who are uh, looking at that intersection of trauma and the 12 steps. And then also a step workbook uh, for people to do uh, the 12 steps in a trauma-informed way. Um, the other book that, I, that I'm encouraging people to look at, though, uh, in these times is my first book, Clinical Dharma, which is the use of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path of the Historical Buddha as a way of self-care for the caregiver. And now in these times, we're all very aware that we're all caregivers. So when I wrote the book in 2016, I was like, this will be helpful to people who are not doctors and nurses, but now it's, it's much more, I, I reread it, and I'm like, okay, this is pertinent for all of us at this time. So just a, a shout out for that book as well. Oh, it's fantastic. And again, we'll have the links to all that and your uh, website where you have some blogs and other resources that are available for uh, folks. Dr. Danziger, this has been great. Thank you for highlighting and really breaking down uh, from an educator, really, you know, educator and therapist standpoint, what this modality is, the history of it, who could benefit from it, and really what its potential is for healing. Uh, we really appreciate it, and I thank you for coming on the Broken Brain Podcast. Thanks so much, Drew. See you again sometime.